I am uh, Robin Axel Adams. I am the manager of the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics, and we're so excited um, that we have a, a great response to our lecture today. Um, just as a reminder, if you did not sign in um, when you walked in or if, for our broadcast sites, wherever the sign-in sheet is, that is how you will get your CE and your CEUs or your CMEs. Um, and, but they, you will only get them towards the end of the lecture series. And so um, don't be anxious if you're not getting emails immediately. And the lecture series ends in May. Um, you'll also receive an evaluation in May. This lecture is being recorded and broadcast today, and so we are so welcome um, to, um, we are so excited to welcome the IU hospitals from Arnett, Ball, Blackford, Bloomington, Jay, and North, so we're glad you all have joined us. The IU School of Dentistry here in Indianapolis, uh, Reed Health, Peyton Manning's Children's Hospital, and the Chaplain Research Symposium are all joining us today um, via, via webcam, so we're so excited you're with us. I just want to remind you to silence your devices um, so that they don't, if they go off, they will not um, bother our lecture. And to please leave the auditorium to um, return your phone calls. We also uh, just want to thank everyone. If you've attended a past um, lecture this, in this year, you received an email from Annie Motts um, asking for feedback and suggestions for future lecture topics. And we've received so many of those. And so we um, thank you so much for helping us as, as you will help us guide our lecture series for, for to come. And then finally, Elizabeth has um, no relevant financial conflicts that she would like to disclose or, she ne or that she needs to disclose. <laughs> We're also excited about this lecture because it is a part of, uh, this lecture is a part of the series with the enterprise goals and thinking about um, how, we, how we think about behavioral health and mental health especially. And, um, and so we're excited to again partner with uh, the enterprise goals that IU Health and that IU School of Medicine have. So to provide an introduction, Elizabeth Boring is a, um, a social worker who's earned her master's degree, but she is the program manager for Hope and Healing Pre um, Pediatric Bereavement Program at Riley Hospital for Children here at IU Health. She began working with bereaved parents and siblings in 2010 and has offered bereavement services to over 2,000 families. As a member of the National Alliance for Grieving Children, she's passionate about the topics of grief and loss and enjoys providing education to professionals, students, and the community. Prior to joining IU Health, Elizabeth worked with children and families who experienced trauma, abuse, and neglect. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology and Child Development from Indiana State University and a Master's of Social Work from Indiana University. She is indeed a licensed social worker in the state of Indiana, and we are honored and privileged to have her come and share with us today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I'm super excited to see the turnout because I usually speak on topics that people um, are uncomfortable with. So this is really exciting to see everyone here today. We are indeed going to talk about, if I can get my clicker to go. Nope. I don't know where he went. So we'll go the old-fashioned way, maybe. Oh, do you have a special? No, I don't. The last time I just started walking and it turned over. Oh, I have a special. I do. <laughs> That's okay. I can do it the old fashioned way. That works. No worries. There we go. All right. So today we're going to talk about childhood trauma and why that it's important we know about childhood trauma. So the title today is When the Past Resurfaces, The Lingering Effects of Childhood Trauma. Our objectives are to define trauma and the different types of trauma that are most commonly experienced within childhood, describe the short-term symptoms and long-term consequences of that exposure, and then we're also going to um, discuss screening and assessment tools, as well as resources available for children, families, and of course, you all, the providers. So trauma gets thrown around a lot. Most commonly, it's referred to when we're speaking about a physical injury to the body, right? At least in the medical setting. But we also know there's such a thing called psychological trauma. And I really love this definition from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They say individual trauma results from an event, series of events, 
or set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. The two reasons I like this definition really well is because it's a circumstance or an event that's experienced. It doesn't have to be an actual threat. It can be a perceived threat. Okay, so I'll give you an example. If we were to find out that there was, God forbid, some type of active shooter on IUPUI's campus, that can be interpreted as a threat, right? Even if that individual was never actually here threatening our integrity. Does that make sense? Okay, so it is a perceived threat. And the second reason I like this definition is because it addresses the different dimensions of self, right? The mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Trauma doesn't just affect us physically, and it doesn't just affect us emotionally. There are other aspects of ourself that are impacted by traumatic experiences. So now that we know the definition of trauma, it's important to think about the different types of trauma that children experience. These are the most common types. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, medical trauma, and that doesn't necessarily have to be inpatient. My um, poor daughter had to have a flu and strep swab this weekend, and she most certainly experienced that as traumatic. <laughs> Um, and honestly, I was an adult when I had it, and it was traumatic. So it doesn't have to be um, an inpatient procedure for someone to experience that as traumatic. Any early childhood trauma, so this usually occurs within zero to six years. These are the types of traumas that they may not have the recollection that it ever happened, but it did happen during their lifetime. Traumatic grief, which tends to be the world I work in. Refugee trauma placement in foster care, institutionalization, or incarceration, complex trauma, which is multiple exposure. So those are the kids that are exposed to more than one type of trauma. Separation due to divorce or perhaps deployment, bullying, community violence, disasters, and then we have terrorism and violence. So these are different types of trauma that kids can experience, and by no means is this a comprehensive list, right? So kids can experience other types of trauma and it can be very real for them even if it's not identifiable on this particular list. For example, I moved um, from California to Indiana and certainly that was a traumatic experience for me. <laughs> not just the weather, but the culture is very different and I left everything I knew back there when I was a kid, right? So that was not um, an easy experience for me. That wouldn't necessarily fit into one of these categories. Fortunately, I had protective factors, which we'll talk about later. So when we talk about the different types of childhood trauma, it's usually referred to in terms of adverse childhood experiences. Is anyone familiar with the ACEs tool? Right? So it's really popular, it's well known now, um, and the ACEs tool talks about the events that kids experience that then have long-term consequences, okay? And they divide it into these three particular categories, which would include household challenges, abuse, and neglect. The abuse and neglect are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to focus on the household challenges, and that includes witnessing intimate partner violence, sometimes referred to as domestic violence, substance misuse within the household, doesn't have to be a parent, it could be a sibling or an extended family member, someone living in the home, mental illness within the household, parental separation or divorce, and then incarceration of a household member. And the interesting thing is, so the original ACE study was done in 1998, or published in 1998, and it predominantly focused on a, um, so it was done through Kaiser Permanente, and it predominantly focused on white kind of middle class suburban individuals. So they completed the survey while they were at their primary care physician's office. And um, there are some limits to that, right? Uh, it's not encompassing of the general population at all. So in the original study, they found that 64% of respondents had experienced at least one of these, one ACE, okay? 
in a 2013 study from the University of Illinois Chicago found that 80 percent of people of color have experienced at least one ACE, right? So it's important to know that this is not um, universally applied. It's not something where you can say, oh, this study is great, we know this happens. You have to take into context the environment in which people grow up in and systematic injustices as well that contribute to people experiencing traumatic events in childhood. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So this is a really neat little demonstration of the most common experiences within these different categories. So when it came to ACEs under abuse, the most common type that a child experienced was physical abuse at 28%. The ACEs and household challenges, the most common type was substance abuse within the home, followed not too far behind by separation and divorce. And then the next um, category, neglect, the most common was emotional neglect. And the interesting thing about this to keep in mind is, so lots of people could raise their hand and say like, oh, like we had a dysfunctional household, right? This, what this illustrates is it's not that you had odd things in your household or maybe your parent wasn't the greatest. It is chronic toxic stress. It is that it never alleviates. So you can see the substance abuse. I have worked with a family and um, the father is, uh, really struggles with alcoholism. The kids come home from school and ask mom, has dad been drinking today? It's not a safe space in the home. Every day there's constant anxiety and toxic stress that the children are trying to navigate through so they can make appropriate coping decisions, right? That's the big difference. It's not that odd things happened or that your parents divorced, is that it was chronic stress when it comes to household challenges. So then when we talk about um, ACEs, I think it's important to know how prevalent this is because that really influences why it's important to talk about in the first place, right? If this weren't common, maybe it wouldn't be such an important topic. But unfortunately, it's extremely common. We talked about the 2013 survey that found that 80% of people of color have had at least one ACE, right? Well, there was a 2011 national survey of children's exposure to violence, which included children from one month to 17 years. In that survey, they found 41% of children, zero to 17 years, have experienced a physical assault, almost half. 13.8% experienced child abuse or maltreatment. 6% six experience, six experienced sexual victimization, but when they broke it down to the age group of four to se 14 to 17, 10.7% of girls had experienced a sexual assault. 22% have witnessed community violence or family violence. 37 experienced a bomb threat at school. And I did recognize when I was pulling data, so 2011 was the most recent one I could find, and when I was pulling data, I was thinking that would now be replaced with what? School shooting, right? Active shooter. And then um, heartbreakingly, 57.7% of the children in this survey experienced or witnessed at least one type of trauma. Over half have experienced a type of trauma. The map of the United States shows um, the prevalence of ACEs. So the common number was two. If your state scored higher than two, you're orange. If they store, scored significantly higher than two, you're red. You'll see that Indiana is red. So the kids in our state are exposed to higher numbers of trauma than the national average of two. Okay. So I kind of love this because this tends to be a bit of my personality. Um, and it says, Calvin says, wherever or whenever I take my bath, I always put my ducky in first. And Hobbs says for companionship. And Calvin says, no, to test for sharks. <laughs> and I love it because it illustrates how trauma influences how we see the world, right? When we constantly are threatened, we will perceive the world as a threatening place. 
right? So you will test the water for sharks because you won't trust that the water is safe. Make sense? So continuing on why it matters, we'll take a look at this pyramid out of the CDC, which I think really illustrates how trauma builds and builds and builds with lasting consequences. So at the very bottom, you have generational embodiment and historical trauma. That builds and influences then the social conditions that expose children to trauma and the local context, okay? On top of that, you have adverse childhood experiences. So if you see this generational embodiment would mean that there's generations of trauma, generations of um, racism, violence, those type of things. That creates social conditions that are ripe for adverse childhood experiences, okay? Those adverse childhood experiences then disrupt neurodevelopment, which in turn disrupts social, emotional, and cognitive functioning, which then creates an adoption of risk behavior, which leads to disease, disability, social problems, and early death. So we'll talk a little bit about how each of those builds onto one another and why trauma results in negative health consequences. So there are some short-term symptoms of childhood exposure, and these are if a child encounters trauma, this is what you might expect them to be exhibiting, okay? They might have difficulty with self-regulation, so this would be maybe a low frustration tolerance, um, they get agitated very easily, or something that you wouldn't expect to upset them, maybe would expect them, and it's a very big reaction. They might have difficulty eating or sleeping, they could express um, some physical symptoms. So they might complain of pain. They might have nightmares or really intense emotions. And that's not always negative emotions. They may seem um, really excited about something that doesn't necessarily make sense. They're kind of exaggerated emotions, if, if that um, illustrates it. They could have some depression or anxiety symptoms they could regress. So previous developmental milestones may no longer be attainable for them. They may be um, several months or a couple years behind what they were doing. It's not uncommon for a child who's experienced trauma to regress to like baby talk, if that makes sense. And then they could have attachment changes. And this could be because their attachment figure is no longer trustworthy. Um, or it could be because their attachment figure is in the home that they no longer think is safe, okay? So these would be some of the shorter term ones that we would really expect to see after a child experiences a traumatic event. And these aren't really that different from adults, right? So this is kind of building back on that pyramid again. The long-term consequences of trauma affects different biological responses. So um, studies have shown in the nervous system, the prefrontal cortex is actually smaller in children who have had chronic exposure to trauma. The endocrine system has chronic activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That is our stress response system. So it's chronically activated. Remember the Calvin and Hobbes comment, there's always a perceived threat, right? It's always activated because you're always waiting for that next threat. And then in the immune system, there's an elevated baseline inflammation level, an elevated inflammatory response to stress as well. So it actually impacts, and if we go back real quick, you can see, so these adverse childhood experiences disrupt the neurodevelopment. Okay, and when that neurodevelopment is disrupted, we then end up with social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. So here are the social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Behavior changes. So um, some of the long-term consequences that certainly impact health is there's a lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, and missed work. And then those in turn result in physical and mental health issues, including severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, sexually transmitted infections, heart disease, 
cancer, stroke, COPD, and broken bones. So it's quite extensive what they've been able to link the ACE scores to these long-term health out outcomes, right? It's not just that someone might suffer from depression. It's not just that someone might have anxiety. It's also that they have physical health problems as a result of having gone through those ACE events, right? So when, when we looked at that definition at the very beginning and it talked about the dimensions of self that were impacted by trauma, it mentioned physical, emotional, social, cognitive, and spiritual, right? And these are some of the ways it manifests long term. So there's also an impact from this chronic exposure, including the annual cost associated with child maltreatment is $1.3 billion. The lifetime cost, $401 billion. The annual cost, just the annual cost in North America on health outcomes related to ACEs is $748 billion a year. And something that I thought was very striking is the reduction in life expectancy. So someone that scores high on their ACEs will have um, on average 20 years shorter life expectancy than someone who has lower ACE score. Yeah. So high is anything greater than four. So it's zero to 10 um, and anything greater than four is considered high. Yep, great question. So now that I've depressed everyone with uh, all the consequences of trauma, it's good to note that there are protective factors, right? So clearly my move to California didn't distress me such that I can't function um, because I had really great protective factors. And we need, to, we need to acknowledge that there are protective factors, that communities and cultures have ways of protecting their um, residents, their family members, and their communities. So one of, the, one of the main protective factors is resilience, and that's the ability to stay calm and in control when faced with a challenge. Living in a safe neighborhood. So think about if, if you have a lot of um, household dysfunction, right? So your A scores perhaps are from um, substance use in the home or um, inter or interpersonal violence, those type of things. You can see why living in a safe neighborhood then would be a protective factor because if you leave the home, if you go out and play, if you go to your neighbor's house, you're safe, right? Your home may not be, but your neighborhood is. You have a safe place to go. Likewise, attending a safe school is a protective factor. Again, if you don't perceive your home as a safe place or the people in your home as safe, having somewhere outside of your home to go is a protective factor. Parental monitoring, so that involves really just an engaged parent, a parent that asks questions, where are you going, who are you hanging out with, what are you guys going to be doing, that type of thing. It's not the helicopter, you know, GPS on their phone parent, although that would be okay too. It's really more knowing what your child's doing, being involved in who their friends are, where they're going in their activities. A high level of family functioning and engagement, which at first might seem counterintuitive, right? Because we're thinking like, oh, well, families cause the problems. But if you think of community violence as an adverse childhood experience, right, then your home is your safe place. If you don't live in a safe neighborhood, if you don't go to a safe school, then your home is going to be a protective factor for you. And then the last is a stable nurturing caregiver. Again, say you have a family member who uses substance in the home or who's incarcerated or deployed, those type of things. There isn't a parent in the home. If you do have that stable nurturing caregiver, it is a protective factor against adverse experiences in childhood. So this is kind of lengthy, but I absolutely love it. We have this, um, this practice of kind of assuming that people need to process their experiences in a certain way in order to move forward. Sometimes people say talk, sometimes people say specific types of therapy. This comes up frequently um, with our grief 
families in that families will often say, um, I don't think my child's grieving. I don't think they're processing what happened because they don't see their child exhibit an emotional response or they don't hear their child talk about their grief, right? And this um, from SAMHSA, again, I think does a really beautiful job summarizing why we need trauma-informed care. We need to look at this from a different perspective. Survivors' immediate reactions in the aftermath of trauma are quite complicated and are affected by their own experiences. The accessibility of natural supports and healers, their coping and life skills, and those of immediate family and the responses of the larger community in which they live. Although reactions range in severity, even the most acute responses are natural responses to manage trauma. They are not a sign of psychopathology. Coping styles vary from action-oriented to reflective and from emotionally expressive to reticent. Clinically, a response style is less important than the degree to which coping efforts successfully allow one to continue necessary activities, regulate emotions, sustain self-esteem, and maintain and enjoy interpersonal contacts. Indeed, a past major error in traumatic stress psychology, particularly regarding group or mass traumas, was the assumption that all survivors need to express emotions associated with trauma and talk about the trauma. More recent research indicates that survivors who choose not to process their trauma are just as psychologically healthy as those who do. The most recent psychological debriefing approaches emphasize respecting the individual's style of coping and not valuing one type over another. And the really important takeaway from this is two things. One, that just because someone's eliciting response to a trauma does not mean something is wrong with them, right? It is not inherently psychopath, um, where is it? Not, not a sign of psychopathology because someone expresses their reaction to a trauma, right? The other piece is that people can cope and they can cope really well, even if it doesn't fit our narrative of what coping looks like, right? So again, in the grief world, a lot of people assume that crying and talking about their loss is how someone processes it. That's different for a child. That's completely different. Sometimes children process it very, very differently, and it isn't helpful. It's actually more traumatizing to them to sit and talk about it over and over again, right? We inherently have a need to cope, and our kind of litmus test as to whether or not something, someone is coping well is are they functioning? Are they functioning well? right, then they're coping well. So it says in here too, clinically a response style is less important than the degree to which coping efforts successfully allow one to continue necessary activities. That should be our benchmark. Is this person functioning well, doing what they need to do, then they're coping well, right? Even if it doesn't fit our narrative of what coping might look like, okay? So then when we talk about trauma-informed care, what does it look like, right? So it's one thing to know that everyone's trauma is unique to the, themselves, that they may cope differently, that they may process differently, but what does that look like then when we interact with people who have experienced childhood trauma? First, it's safety. We need to ensure physical and emotional safety. Second, it's choice, that the individual does have some control some choice and some control. The third would be to collaborate and share decision-making power. The fourth is trustworthiness, task clar clarity, consistency, and interpersonal boundaries. And then the last is empowerment. And you can see why so many of these are important, right? If someone doesn't feel safe, they don't feel like they have choices. They don't feel like they can trust the person working with them right? That is why it's the very first one. They have to feel safe in order to then continue on, make good choices, collaborate with their healthcare team, trust that the treatment plan is going to work, and feel empowered to make further healthcare decisions for themselves. So these give a few examples of um, how it would look in practice, right? So for safety, the common areas are welcome and privacy is respected. For choice, the individuals are provided a clear and appropriate message about their rights and responsibilities. 
for collaboration, individuals are provided a significant role in planning and evaluating services. They're respected and boundaries are maintained under trustworthy, excuse me, trustworthiness. And then for empowerment, providing an atmosphere that allows individuals to feel validated and affirmed with each and every contact. Oh, okay. So we're gonna start next with talking about screening tools. So now that you kind of know, right, the trauma care approach, we're gonna talk about different screening tools so you can see if someone you're working with may have been exposed to trauma. Now we already heard the statistic, right, that half of individuals have been exposed to trauma. So it's safe to assume that many people have experienced trauma in their life. That is not to say that they have had that higher, higher rate of over four, right? So the lower number of adverse childhood experiences you have, the lower the risk for those negative health outcomes, the lower the risk that it's going to complicate things in your development. The more of those adverse childhood experiences you have, the higher the risk that it's going to complicate things in your development and the higher the risk then you're gonna have negative health outcomes. So it's important to know what your patient or family you're working with has gone through, right? So here are some cool screening tools. I put this up here so if you um, scan the QR code, it's gonna take you to the National Childhood Traumatic Stress Networks website. And the cool thing about this is there is a bank of resources. So if you were to scan that and you were to go in, like I said, you'll see a bank of all those assessment tools. So you can find one that fits the setting and the environment that you work in, and you can keep it on hand, or you can find one that meets um, your client's needs, right? So one that's more appropriate for them. So there's some that are adolescent, there's some specific for children, anxiety, all different ones. So if we were to go into this one, just to give you an example, it's gonna tell you what it is, the author, if it costs any money, those type of things. And then you can find like the population information, if there are any translations. It's a very cool resource to be able to find a tool that can help you in your setting. And then the next one that's really cool is the Pediatric Medical Traumatic Stress Toolkit for healthcare providers, which is this QR code. So if you scan that one, it's gonna take you directly to that page. And it is an entire toolkit that you can use um, in a pediatric medical setting. So having a child in the hospital is inherently traumatic, right? That is not a normal experience for people. And so it's important for us to recognize that the families we are working with are actively in, engaging in a traumatic situation for them. Even if everything is going well, it is not normal for them to be here. It is not normal for them to see their child needing medical care, okay? Um, I <coughs> spoke with a mom, and this was really interesting. Her um, child fortunately survived cancer, and he um, was very young at the time he was diagnosed and went through treatment. So he was, I think, around one when he was diagnosed and finished treatment closer to two or three and is doing great. He's 11 now, doing really well, but she talks about the trauma they endured and that they don't feel like they have a place for it because he survived. So she talks about having to hold down her one-year-old child and have really painful things happen to him and that the body doesn't recognize that that is justified trauma. Does that make sense? It's still trauma. If you were to remove the circumstances and all you saw was your child in distress, all you heard was your child screaming and you couldn't get to them, you couldn't change what was happening to them, that is trauma, even if the outcome is positive. So she talks about how traumatic that was for her and still entering the hospital, even though he's healthy, even though it's been a number of years, is very traumatic for her when she hears certain things or smells certain things, okay? I know the families I work with certainly have those kind of um, traumatic associations and triggers, of course, because their children have died here. But it's important to recognize that even if a treatment is going well, or even if that child is going to be okay, the family is still experiencing something that may be very, very traumatic for them. So that toolkit is really, really cool.
Um, the next one is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They have some really great information about trauma-informed care and trauma-informed approaches. You can download an entire booklet on it. They also talk about training. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, is a great resource to learn more about child abuse and the ACE tool. The National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement is a wonderful resource and they link to a resource for educators as well in how to work with children who are grieving um, and they can complete free modules. So they do a lot of education and a lot of training in terms of how to work with kids who have experienced something very difficult. The APA has information on child trauma and then the Child Welfare Information Gateway also has some really good information as well. And there are some references. So with that, do we have any questions? If you have questions, I have a microphone because we have viewers listening. So raise your hand. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I don't know. There we go. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. My name is Brian Leland. I'm the fellowship director at FCME for our Clinical Ethics Fellowship. I was wondering if you could speak a little to, um, as I looked or listen, listen and looked, believe it or not, uh, through the list of traumas that you identified, um, I guess I became almost depressed saying like, how is the list not a 100% response rate? Right. And some of these things I think are inherently unavoidable. Like you may very likely have a loved one die from an unexpected medical problem, or you may witness some violence and not to downplay the impact on that. But so I think the question I have is, to me it seems <clears throat> that the focus should be on working through strategies to improve resilience or other coping mechanisms and what kind of infrastructure is in place to help facilitate that um, or those types of programs? Right, so that's a really good question. So yes, um, if we go back to the list of all these different particular traumas that kids can experience, right, there we go. It does get a little depressing, right? Because you think, well, golly, like most kids have probably experienced something like this. And certainly the results of the ACE study indicate that. So two things to remember is that simply experiencing one of these is not necessarily a sentence, if you will, to having adverse or negative health outcomes, right? It is correlated to the more of these you have the more the risk for those health outcomes. And the key is those protective factors. So even if you experience several of these, if you have really good protective factors, that nurturing, caring, stable adult in your life, those, it's, those ACE scores are not as relevant. They don't hold the significance that someone who doesn't have the protective factors would experience, if that makes sense. And it, this goes then into policy. So for like just a total side note, how do we support families? How do we nurture relationships? How do we help families where kids have a safe community to grow up in, a safe home we grow up in, right? It branches out. It's like a ripple effect. So I have a, um, a question that's been texted in. When should screening be completed to access, to assess for childhood trauma? Once by the primary MD or when? Yeah, so it's a really good question. It depends on what tool you're using, but I think it's important if, um, so I, it, it hasn't been recommended to universally screen. Nothing I've read recommends use universal screening, but I think what is important is that we be aware of it, and if there is concern that a child is experiencing traumatic events, perhaps at home, or if you're in an established community that is not safe, to be screening for these traumas, right? I think it's, it's very safe to assume that most children will, at some point in their life, experience an adverse childhood or um, have an adverse childhood experience. So we need to make sure it's incorporated into how we care for families, right? We may not have the ability to screen every person, but that doesn't change. We have the ability to interact with them in a trauma-informed approach. 
even if we don't know for a fact whether or not they've experienced trauma. Um, so about two thirds way through the lecture, you got to a long statement that I think basically yeah. to me suggested that whatever a child or person is doing that appears to be working uh, to help them cope uh, if they are doing well, it's not really necessary to pursue any type of uh, uh, psychosocial therapy or anything like that. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of parameters were looked at that this statement was actually uh, was actually based on, and how do you actually determine mm -hmm. if a patient or child is doing well after uh, after suffering some trauma? Sure. So I don't know the studies that they use. So it's out of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and their guidebook for trauma-informed care. And I think what they found was that there was this blanket approach that after a trauma happened, we all needed to debrief and sit down and talk about it. And what they realized was that was causing quite a bit of harm. I don't think they realized that specifically for children, right? But they realized that for adults. There's been a lot of work done, particularly after 9-11, with children's response to trauma because, um, interestingly, so the New York Life Foundation did quite a bit of research on children who were grieving in particular because 3,000 school kids, or uh, 3,000 some school kids in New York City lost parents all at the same time, right? And so they had this mass population of kids who had experienced a trauma and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to support them. That's how the National School Crisis and Bereavement Center was established. That's how they started looking at kids who had experienced trauma and who had experienced grief. So I don't know specifically what data they used to look at this, but I think they have looked over time to see that this particular approach wasn't working for people when they automatically debriefed through talk processing. The other thing is it's not that any coping skill is appropriate. So if someone is self-harming, or someone is disengaging from activities that used to bring them joy, if there is a distinct change in their behavior, then that would indicate that they're not functioning, right? They're not coping well. I'm sorry if you said this and I missed it, but um, this screening is just for kids or would you ever give this to adults? So there are, um, there are screenings for adults. And the ACE tool actually is specifically for adults. So the adverse childhood ex, um, experiences is given to adults and they indicate what ACEs they had experienced as children. But then the um, QR code is specifically tools for working with kiddos. So these are tools you can screen and some of them are completed by parents, right? But these tools are all specifically for working with kids. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I keep jumping. Yep. Hi, my name is Sister Catherine. I'm a mental health practitioner in private practice. Mm -hmm. And I always try to get my ethics through this, uh, through IU, so it's great. Um, I'm glad that you unpacked that slide about trauma-informed care because I was getting a little concerned about it. So it looks really different from chronic ongoing stress in the home. Because yeah. with my adult clients who have suffered from that, the biggest wound is not having it acknowledged. Right, right. So I think the difference is between giving a space for someone to identify what is trauma to them and give them that space versus saying you have to process it in order to move forward. Right. Right. And also in terms of assessing for functioning post-trauma, it's lifetime. Yes. It's absolutely lifetime. Okay. It looks different in adolescence, in the middle years, when women hit menopause, stuff can come up that's been hidden since childhood. I mean, there's no time you stop assessing. Sure. And sometimes people can function really well and then say they become a parent and some of those past traumas come up for them because that isn't something they have found a place for yet. They exactly. haven't processed right. Thank you. Oh. Hi, I'm Jane Hartsock. I'm the Director of Clinical Ethics. I have a question that's maybe like overly specific, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are or what the research on, is on this, but your comment about 
the um, bomb scares now being active shooters. Um, I'm wondering, so, so the new thing, I have two young kids, and so the new thing is the active shooter drills. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on whether the drills are themselves the equivalent of the bomb threat. So they're much more common because right. they happen maybe multiple times a year. Whereas if you were, say, a, a Gen X, you know, the bomb threat was like once during your entire high school career and it was some kid who did not have a bomb. Right. right. And so has there been any reason? They're not evidence-based, right? They haven't been shown to increase safety in schools, but are they increasing trauma? So if you ask Dr. David Schoenfeld, he did a really great interview on this particular topic. Dr. David Schoenfeld is the director of the National School National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. Um, and he will say they are harmful, that we should not be doing them at all. And he is actually, um, so he is a professor at USC. He, his whole research has been on childhood trauma and how children cope. And so he will say, if you, oops, that was my timer to stop. <laughs> if, you, um, if you look up any of his information, his statements on it, and I believe they actually published a policy statement on it, but I would have to double check. But he has spoken countless times on that it is not helpful for, for children. It's traumatizing, and it also doesn't, it's not effective, because then children don't react in a natural way, which would increase their likelihood to seek shelter. Right. I have another one yeah. from um, online. Um, is there potential for separation trauma for children who are admitted to the hospital for long periods of time, like more than 100 days, who have no family? Sorry, my phone just went. Uh, who have no family present on a regular basis? Uh, that's a great question. I would imagine that that could be traumatic for the child. I don't have any data on that specifically, but if we just look at separation in general, right, that that can be considered a trauma, again, it would be based on whether or not that manifests as a trauma. So being exposed, I think that's the big clarification. Being exposed to a trauma doesn't necessarily mean it manifests as a trauma, okay? So you can have exposure, but it's that repeated exposure, the complex exposure over and over again, having more than four of these, that then they start to manifest because it overwhelms our coping system, right? So perhaps that could be traumatic for a child to be separated that long. Perhaps it's not. It would be dependent on that child, their coping, their protective factors. So I have another one that was texted in. Yeah. Uh, what role might a spiritual community or practice have as a resilience resource? That's a really great question. So I think um, building up community is really important. It is a strong, strong protective factor, right? If children feel like they can't trust people in the home, they need people in the community they can trust. That is an important piece. Um, but it doesn't happen just by one interaction or two interactions, right? It's being engaged in the community. It's knowing who your community members are, your parishioners, your spiritual members, whoever that may look like, and being actively engaged with them. Okay. Another one texted in. <laughs> Thank you, community, who's watching. Um, do you find that the severity of the effects of trauma changes based off of the age the trauma was experienced? Mm -hmm. For example, if a person is exposed to a trauma for one year, say domestic violence or, the, or their mother, then is removed from that trauma. If that child was six years old versus two years old, would one be expected to have longer lasting or more severe effects? So if I understand the question, is it correlated to the age, is the effects of trauma correlated to the age in which it happened? I think so. It's sort of the example they gave is that there is a, a mother who's being abused for a year. Uh -huh. Is it different if the child experiences that when the child is six versus when the child is two versus when the child is 14? Sure. So there are in the sense that children process things at different developmental ages, right? So um, perhaps there could, it could be a different impact for that child if it happened when they were two, or if it happened when they're six and they witness it, or it happens when they're 12 and they witness it, right? And think about that. So at two, they certainly would still feel those effects 
right? Like that tension in a house, anyone walked into a room and you can feel the tension. No one has to say anything, but you feel the energy in the room, right? Or mom's in distress. So at two, that two-year-old would still have exposure to the trauma. At six, they may understand that this is happening and mom is now being hurt and not be able to reconcile why that's happening. At 12, perhaps that person then feels guilt for not being able to step in. So it's hard to um, paint a broad brush and say, yes, this is going to impact people at a certain way at a certain age. But I think based on just developmental stages and someone's developmental, um, where they are to, to process what's happened, to understand what's happened, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right, I have another question. Um, so uh, in, in the map that you showed where mm -hmm. different states had different rates of um, adverse childhood um, experiences, do you have any hypotheses as to why Indiana is so high? Uh, so one of it could be the opioid crisis. So well, but cyclical, right? I mean, so if... Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry. So, so this was a snapshot. Okay. I believe it was a snapshot in 2014. Because my hypothesis would be that the opioid crisis is in part related to adverse childhood events. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, so it's a vicious cycle, yeah. Um, so, Indi I mean, Indiana, yes, there are higher rates of poverty. There's higher rates of, of a lot of things that can contribute to adverse childhood experiences, sure. Um, my guess, that particular one, if you're only looking at, like, drug use or exposure in that snapshot. That would probably be my guess. Mm -hmm. previous, oh. previous comment about um, does it make a difference the age of the child? So what you were saying was psychological, but you also had that slide about neurological development. So that high cortisol is neurotoxic and it's going to affect the development, right. the differentiation and integration of brain regions based on the age the child is. Yeah. So the younger, the worse from the neurodevelopmental perspective. Uh, sure, except um, so there are factors. Yes, absolutely. There are, if you go back to that pyramid, right, and you see mm -hmm. that certain, um, uh, let me go back to the period. I'm going to move this slide really quick. <sighs> Second. Okay. So if you look at this generational embodiment, impact social conditions, which in, impacts the adverse childhood experiences. Absolutely. It's, I think the important takeaway is, again, just because a child at two has experienced this doesn't mean they will then have atypical neurodevelopment, right? So I caution someone from making the leap of, oh my gosh, they've experienced domestic violence now they're going to have X, Y, Z, right? Or they've been exposed to that. So that's my caution. Absolutely, it can impact it. The age can impact it. But just having experienced it at two doesn't mean that you will then have this, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, it's not deterministic. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, one more. Mm -hmm. Really good questions. You mentioned that um, this isn't a universal screening tool, but I wonder how these, do you know how these um, studies impact patient provider communication for adults who aren't experiencing their childhood trauma anymore? Can you clarify that? Sure. So um, I know that the ACEs is, is for the surveys for adults. Uh -huh. um, how in a clinical setting does it come to fruition, I suppose. Oh, I see. Okay. So most commonly, ACE tools have been used in like um, therapy, right? So if someone is seeking some type of behavioral mental, mental health care, um, sometimes in a, like a spiritual advisor, if they're trained, they might know for sure. Um, I am not as familiar with the exception of the specific studies with it being administered in like a primary health care setting. Right, so the original study was administered in a primary health care setting um, out in California. And that, with the exception of those, I don't know that it's used in that way. It's certainly used more in 
this person is seeking help, whether it be for drug use or counseling or whatever the case may be, and then it's a tool used to assess for how many ACEs they've experienced and why that trauma may be so significant, right? Or these particular disruptive behaviors may be so significant. But aside from those studies, I don't know of it being used in primary health care. I think it would be great, clearly, because it, it impacts physical health. It impacts biology. So I think it would be wonderful. Yeah. So, Elizabeth, I think this is um, all we have for time. I do okay. have a question that we, um, we should ask proactively. And are you, is it okay if we just share the slides? Are you oh, okay course. with that? All right. Yeah. So if anyone would like the slides, feel free to um, email fcme at iuhealth.org. That's Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics, F-C-M-E at iuhealth.org. If you also um, would like to ever share with anyone these lectures, they are also on our website. Give us a couple of weeks to get this lecture put on our website. But you can also share this out. So F-C-M-E at iuhealth.org. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you.